Today's talk is entitled, Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People? And our scripture comes from 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. For this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. Why do bad things happen to good people? Is a question that most of us have asked or been asked at one time or another. We have all seen people who we know, people who we believe to be good, and yet seen them have something bad happen to them. So how do we explain this to ourselves or to those who are asking us? Quite probably we will come to the conclusion that they have got some sort of hidden sin or some problem that they're not quite as good as we thought they were. Then there is also this expectation that God should protect people, that he will stop these bad things happening to people in this world. Oh, if only Yeshua had dealt with this question, then we would know for sure. Well, I have some good news for you. He does indeed deal with this very issue. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13, starting at verse 1, we read, There were present at that season some who told him about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Yeshua answered them and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans, because they suffered such things? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those eighteen on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. In this passage, Yeshua clearly identifies two different groups of people. There were the Galileans who were murdered by Pilate's men, and then there was the group on whom the tower in Siloam fell. Both these events would have been known to the people who were listening to Yeshua talking. In both cases, he asks if the people who were listening to him thought that those who had been killed were the worst sinners in that particular group. There was an expectation at that time that bad events happened to people because they were sinners. But Yeshua clearly states that this is not the case. He says in each case, I tell you no. But he does state that the people listening to him will also perish in a like manner unless they repent. I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So perhaps we need to repent so that we can gain Yeshua's protection. But if that is so, we need to change our question to why the bad things happen to saved people. Ever since the fall of Adam, this world has been under a curse. Adam allowed Satan to become the ruler of this world. Thus God is no longer the ruler of this world, which may surprise many people. God can no longer do exactly what he wants to do in this world. When Yeshua was tempted by Satan, Satan offered him the whole world. In Matthew 4, 8 and 9 we read, Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendour. All of this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Now, if it was not Satan's to give, it would have been no temptation to Yeshua. So he must have had all the kingdoms of the world and their splendour to be able to offer it to Yeshua. So we see quite clearly 
from that that Satan is the ruler of this world. And those of us who believe in Yeshua, whilst we are still in the world, are now no longer of the world. So we are still living in a curse-filled world. In John 17, verses 15 and 16, we read, I do not pray that you would take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. So Yeshua clearly tells us that we are not of the world, but we are still in it, and we are still subject to the evil one's curse around us. This is an evil world. We only have to be in it, and we are, to know that bad things will happen. And not just to bad people. So this shows us that our initial question is actually wrong. We shouldn't ask why do bad things happen to good people, because bad things happen. They always have and they always will. Bad things happen and people get in the way and then those bad things happen to them. And as I've said earlier, God is not the ruler of this world to stop those bad things from happening. He is not permitted by his own rules to interfere unless specifically asked by those who believe in him. I want us to look at an example in the Bible of how bad things happened to a good person. And we're going to read from the book of Job, chapter 1, verses 1 to 12. I have omitted one or two little bits which don't um, directly relate to this point. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. And his sons would go and feast in their houses, each on his appointed day, and would send and invite for their three sisters to eat and drink with them. So it was, when the days of feasting had run their course, that Job would send and sanctify them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did regularly. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear you for nothing? Have you not made a hedge round him, around his household, around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from among the presence of the Lord. Quite clearly we see that Job was a godly man, whom Satan wanted to tempt and test, just as he does with us. But he was unable to get at him, because God had hedged him around. There was a barrier around Job that God had created that prevented Satan getting through to him. Satan had to wait for Job to allow him through the barrier. Only Job had the power to allow Satan into his life. While Job believed and trusted in God, he was safe behind the barrier. But Job had a fear. The fear was that his children would curse God. And to overcome this, he sacrificed to God regularly for them. But it would be this fear that would allow Satan in. A fear which eventually Job acknowledges 
in chapter 3 verse 25 Job says for the thing I greatly feared has come upon me and what I dreaded has happened to me so why does Job allow Satan in through fear and why is it that that stops God from protecting him why does that remove that barrier now our text that we started off with actually gives us the answer I believe the second half of verse 12 of 2 Timothy 1 says I know whom I have believed I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him so firstly we must know God I know whom I have believed and we can only know the Father through Yeshua when we have seen Yeshua we have seen the Father as Yeshua himself says in John 14 9 have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me Philip he who has seen me has seen the Father so how can you say show us the Father the second point is that we must be persuaded we must be fully persuaded in Romans 4:21, Paul says that being fully convinced or persuaded that what he had promised he was able to perform now here Paul is talking about Abraham and the promise he's received from God that he will have a son and this is despite him being a hundred years old or nearly a hundred years old he was fully persuaded that the circumstances didn't matter he would have the son that God had promised him something that in the natural must have seemed impossible to him but he didn't look at the natural he stood on the promise he was fully persuaded not doubting one little bit and in Mark 11 23 and 24 Yeshua tells us the same thing for assuredly I say to you whoever says to this mountain be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart but believes that those things he says will be done he will have whatever he says therefore I say to you whatever things you ask when you pray believe that you receive them and you will have them now there's a lot in that to unpack but the thing is he says does not doubt in his heart he is fully persuaded so that is point two we must be fully persuaded but of what and that is point three we must be fully persuaded that whatever we have committed to God our situation our possessions whatever we have submitted to God he will keep and that is quite a promise as we go through this curse infested world that we can be assured that our life when committed to God will be saved will be kept and preserved Psalm 37 5 says commit your way to the Lord trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass in 2 Timothy the word in Greek means to deposit to trust or entrust to someone thus the word commit literally means to roll off onto so we must put our trust in him and put into his hands all that we're doing and all that we have we roll it over onto God as we put our situations into his hands we must not doubt that he will take care of it for us and this is where it gets difficult because we must be so certain that God will work it out that we must not take it back and try to work on it for ourselves because it's our situation as soon as we start to take it back God will allow us to if I gave you my car keys and then I asked you for them back you would allow me to take them because they are mine and it's the same with God 
It's our situation. So as soon as we commit it to him, he's holding it. But if we try and take it back, he won't stop us. Now when there is pressure, be it a time constraint or demanding people, we must not fear that God will let us down. That's the time when we will want to take back and do it for ourselves. But that is exactly the time that we need to stop and trust that God will give us the answer. When there is pressure, we must not fear that God will let us down. Because fear will open that door to Satan. And he only needs a crack to push his way in. So rather than fear, we must be so sure of our Father that we are fully persuaded that he will bring the solution to our situation. That there will be a successful conclusion. Fear and faith are related. We saw in Job's example that he allowed Satan in through his fear. We must remember that it is our faith in our Father that will prevent Satan from gaining access in our lives. Fear and faith are actually the same spiritual force, but just in opposite directions. They emanate from different sources. Faith connects us to God. Fear connects us to Satan. Faith comes from hearing the word and meditating upon God's word. Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Fear comes in exactly the same way. Fear comes by hearing and meditating or worrying on the lies that Satan is telling you. Faith is the substance of things. Hebrews 11 tells us in verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So our faith will produce positive results. Fear will produce results as well. That which we worry about will come about. But it won't be a positive result, it'll be a negative result. As Job said, the thing that I greatly feared has come upon me, and what I dreaded has happened to me. And we must remember that we do not have a spirit of fear. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So we should not walk in fear. There's no fear here. We should not talk fear. And it's amazing how much the world does talk fear. Have you ever said, when asked a question, I'm afraid not? Why are you afraid? Why do you have fear about what was asked? A simple yes or no would have done, surely. So in conclusion, if we are asked by somebody, why do bad things happen to good people? We need to point out to them that that is actually the wrong question. Bad things happen and people get in the way. The question that we should really be asking is how can you stop the bad things happening to you? in this evil world? And the answer, as Yeshua says, is to repent. What a wonderful opportunity to get into some evangelism at that point. But on a personal level, we need to ensure that we commit our ways and our possessions to the Lord, knowing, fully persuadedly knowing, that he is able to keep them until that day the day that they are needed. We need to be fully persuaded in him and stand on his promises. Do not be tempted to take back our problems, our situations, to try and sort them out for ourselves. We must remember that Yeshua is our caretaker and let him 
do his job. In 1 Peter 5, 6-11 we read, Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion for ever and ever. Amen.